In studio with New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap and Martinsburg City Councilman Corey Roman. Good morning to both of you once again. Thank you Glad to be in. here. Great to have you. It's an honor. No, really. The honor is mine. It should be uh, your honor, your honor. I <laughs> sing of Caddyshack every time that comes up. <laughs> right, your honor, your honor. We have uh, via telephone Senator Patricia Rucker, who's in a different time zone, and that messed her up yesterday. Senator Rucker, good morning to you. Good morning. Yes, I apologize once again for yesterday, but very grateful to be with you all this morning. Absolutely. So what time? Oh, you're in Arizona? Yes. I mean, what time zone is Arizona in during our, well, the, while we're in Eastern Standard Time? Are you two hours behind or three? I'm two hours behind. And you should be three, right? Because you're, you're on the West. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's and that weird. really confused me yesterday. Sorry. Does, does the entire state not do the whole daylight savings time thing? Exactly. The entire state doesn't change time. All right. Can, can a state just elect to do that itself? I guess you can. Until a few years ago, Indiana was half and half, right? Well, no, it was by county. So you could, cro- <laughs> you could cross the street and cross the time zone. Everybody got to make their own decision. I think it should be by household. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why not by household? Freedom. <laughs> oh, Who's the government to tell me what time it is? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I will decide the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I've been operating under the wrong principles this entire time. Self-evident. I'll just tell Mr. Hornby, 6 a.m.? My, my time says 10 a.m. What do you do? <laughs> Uh, Patricia, let's talk about Route 340 first and foremost, because I saw an article uh, yesterday that it's going to be done on Friday. They're going to reopen it Friday? At 4 p.m. Friday, 340 is going to open. You know... Can't even express how grateful I will be. I feel like all things are possible now that a project has been finished, what, 10 days early? (laughs) Yes, exactly. That is an absolute miracle. But, no, we're really grateful. The weather cooperated. We didn't have any incidences of where they had to pause and um, wait several days before getting back on it. And, obviously, you know, I'm very grateful that the good incentives we gave them to be done on time, obviously, was helpful. Am, the, am I the only one that was raised on Roadrunner cartoons with the big rocks that are coming down on Wiley Coyote? You like you know, that? You, yeah, I, I just, you know, it's, it, no, it, I saw those it, cartoons too. Being, I hope early is good under the circumstances. No, no it would be great to have that reopen. Well, open. My understanding is that uh, there was uh, more or less an expert on site who was given the authority to make decisions to keep this project moving quickly instead of having to go back for permission all the time and and getting it lost in a bureaucracy, Patricia. Yeah, I heard that too, although can't can't say who I heard it from, but yes, that I think that was the general way they managed to do this and maybe they'll learn from this and do that more often, who knows. Yeah, that that was going to be my comment is if, you know, we we had this type of system and we came out 10 days ahead of schedule when I remember at the beginning of this, we were, we had our fingers crossed that we were going to be on time. Um, maybe that is the way to go. DOH. So uh, maybe decentralization. We'll... It was, uh, decentralization. Your, your competitor, delegate Paul Espinosa told us about that in appearance earlier this week. And I think that that is, uh, hopefully a lesson West Virginia government can learn going forward. Mm-hmm. Right. I think we that's the point you're making so. there too, right? Yeah. We we actually have tried in the Senate to pass a bill to decentralize DOH several times, and it hasn't made it through both houses. But um, actually to officially, you know, make it that you will decentralize decision making. So what's the objection to it? Who, who is who's not on board with wanting to decentralize this? To be honest, I believe it's the governor's office who does not like um, us telling um, one of his departments, what to do or how to do it. Oh, very paternalistic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it worked in this case, and and it I, sure I, I did. hope it would continue to work uh, uh, going forward. Are you out in Arizona on official business? I am at a legislative conference, and I'm learning about good ideas I could take bring back home. Um, today, I'm on the schedule. Going to be talking about education, one of my favorite topics, and also about health, Uh, learning about health sharing ministries and um, other type of ideas that states are adopting that are helping to improve their um, state's health.
programs. Well, let's talk about education. You have a lot uh, of experience in that, obviously, as a former chair, and then as someone who's also headed up the project of getting charter schools established in the state, too. What kind of things are you discussing in Arizona that you can bring back to West Virginia to help improve education? So one of the topics is how to improve the uh, implementation of school choice programs, um, better systems so that the money is um, more quickly getting where it needs to go, easier to track it and see where it's going. So, you know, that would be interesting. There's also topics about the science of reading. And as you know, we passed a bill last uh, session that had to do with literacy. And um, I added an amendment to include dyslexia and dyscalculia screening. I'm hoping that they're going to be talking a little bit about that and what are the different options that systems can use. We mandated that there be screenings for, uh, three times um, from kindergarten to third grade and then as needed afterwards. And maybe there's some something I can learn about that I can bring to our school districts to help them to do those screenings um, in the best way Matt, um, possible. I'm also going to get to tour a school that is for kids that have um, serious behavioral and mental disorders. And so that would be really interesting. Here in Arizona, they have had many, many, many um, school choice options for years. They, they were one of the forerunners in the school choice movement. And they have specialized schools that are just for the student population that is extremely um, challenging. And so I'm going to get to visit one of these schools, and I'm definitely interested in seeing what that looks like, how they do what they do, and how they're able to provide a uh, educational experience for students that need something different in a traditional classroom. John. Um, good morning. Uh Marshall Wilson was just um, on the show immediately before you, and we were talking about education, specifically the State Board of Education, which, in in his words, the State Board of Education is a directorate when it should be a consultancy. And he uh, recommends, you know, if if he's elected governor, he would make changes to the State Board of Education that would essentially shift the powers of education decision making down to the local level. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so I'm not exactly certain um, how that looks like. I will tell you that most other states do have decentralized education and decisions, a lot more decisions are made locally. But having said that, I will say West Virginia being what it is, which is a very small state with not a whole lot of resources, one does wonder how the local school districts would be able to do what I'm hoping is going to happen here, but I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I know, oh, if we just did this, this is going to fix it all. Senator Rucker, uh, Corey Roman here. Uh, thank you for, for being here. And I, I, I really do share the same sentiment with you when it comes to public education. Um, when it comes to, you know, school choice and charter schools of that, I'm not, I'm not too keen or, um, knowledgeable on, you know, the different processes that happen across the country. Um, but especially with public education, we, we continually, we hear this. I mean, it's, it's year after year, um, you know, legislature after legislature, we hear the, the exact same thing, that the money is, is not making it down. Um, and I know that you, you know, you just shared that same sentiment and said that you don't have all the answers. But what, what are some ideas that we that we can we can have? Because we can't we can't sit back and, and be five years down the road and say that we, we still have the same the same problems, which if, if we look at five years ago, I, I would contend that's the same argument we've been having. So do you have any idea of or solution that that would bring some type of remedy to this? Well, I, I will tell you, I, I do strongly believe that empowering parents to make decisions and to be able to decide my child can go to this school because mm -hmm. this school can provide a better option for them right. does put a little bit of pressure on the system, yeah. on the existing system to, oh boy, if we don't change and if we're not providing what parents need, we could potentially lose those parents. So I do believe that outside pressure 
is definitely needed. Outside of that, I will tell you, we it's very easy to say this, but I'm, I mean, I just think it's true. We need to re- really analyze where the money is going. If all of this administration that we have, both in the state education department and in the local county administration, is really needed, what are they actually doing? We have heard about you know, government being bloated. Um, I can tell you that when Republicans got into power through the leadership that um, we have had, we definitely have um, caused some more reshifting and, and downsizing of some parts of the state education system. But, you know, I was very disappointed that as we found more ways to send money to our local counties, the local counties chose to hire more administrators. And there are definitely some administration that is needed. There is some folks at the top that they're the ones that manage um, the resources and make certain the right person is hired for the right job and those type of things. I would love to do an analysis of what Really, what is the right number of administrators to students that we should have? We do know that there is a wide discrepancy. Some school districts have a lot more than others. But what is the perfect way? Well, I will tell you, education conference after education conference that I've attended, I hear lots of different ideas. I hear, you know, this state is doing it this way, this other state is doing it this way. I, what the problem is, I really don't know of any that is super happy. Um, I missed an opportunity to go to Finland this year, which would have been great. Finland is touted as one of the very best education systems in the entire world. And I know that for them, teachers are considered the very top, like one of the top professions you can do. And they treat them as one of the top professions you could possibly choose. And students that have very high grades are the ones that go into education. Um, it's, a, it's a very different system than we have here. And gosh, I, I, you know, one talks about it and it's like, well, of course, that makes perfect sense to me. What is more important than the job of teacher? But it's difficult to implement that. And I honestly, I will tell you, I struggle because I know that there's a certain role for us government officials to have. And it is not necessarily to be dictating um, all of these different things. I would love to be able, which is what I tried to do, um, to empower the local school districts to start making more decisions for themselves and to be more flexible and we did that with the Education Reform Bill of 2019, but it's been um, this many years, and honestly, there's very few counties that changed one single thing, even after they were empowered with so much more um, ability to make decisions at a local level. Yeah, it, it, has it ever occurred to you, has it ever come up in Charleston at State House that perhaps we're just trying to do too much? that um we've we've got this this bloated system of uh an education system the board of education and and all the way down bloated with money high per capita spending on students <clears throat> that's not making significant changes when it comes to test scores and such it seems to me i've never been a teacher and i'm from a different generation but it seems to me that the the calculus here is is really pretty easy you got you got kids in the classroom you got a teacher at the front of the room the teacher's job is to teach the kids in the classroom and if government were to stay out of the way and allow teachers to maintain order in their classrooms the way certainly that it used to be with me rob went to catholic schools so i'm sure it was either a harsher grade school grade, public high school okay and just to me, it's just not that complicated a thing to educate students. It seems to me that perhaps we should consider that government is the problem, that there's, there's more and more stuff being inserted into what is essentially an uncomplicated system. Is there any merit to that thought at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know that regulations um, are, are stifling so much of the things that uh, teachers c- 
could be, should be concentrating on. But one of the things that I learned once I got elected, um, so when it comes to federal regulations, we don't have any power to really change that. And I actually pushed for a bill that never made it through that would say that no new um, federal funds would be accepted if they came tied with regulations unless the legislature approved it. Because unfortunately, our system here in West Virginia, if the federal money wants to offer a public school um, something, they, um, the state board of education gets to say, yes, we'll take it. We don't have a say in it in the state, but almost always those funds come with more rules. You must do this, 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 this. So I wanted, I tried to pass that bill with that language for three years, and I have, I have given up. It never, ever um, ran. And then the, um, and that's with me being education chair. I could not get it through both houses. But then the other thing is the state regulation. So in that education reform bill, we tried to um, reduce and increase flexibility. I don't know if you remember, we minimized the testing requirements. Um, we took away a ton of the things that was telling them how to spend their money and told them, nope, 70% of the funds we send you, the ones that aren't tied to federal mandates, you all can spend. You local school districts can spend in what way that you think is best. We increased their funding. And then we have had several bills. We tried to remove, you know, parts of the state code when in regards to education. But believe it or not, it's the unions, the teachers associations have opposed us removing um, some of the regulations from the, at the state level. And I wasn't there, but supposedly it was them that advocated for those rules, you know, because they believe it, you know, it's, it is, it's important. It's important to have those, they call it protections. Um, so there, there is some pushback. Now, I don't, I don't know what to tell you other than in our state, um, all of the uh, legislation that we passed is essentially a suggestion to the State Board of Education because there was a Supreme Court ruling in West Virginia that says that they get to run the education system. So we must fund it. That, that's a constitutional mandate. We must fund it. But the Supreme Court of West Virginia, and this is years ago, um, basically said if, if the State Board of Education wants to ignore any law that the legislature passes, they can. So it's a weird system of, of give and take, and we try to work with them because we do want to help them. I don't know of a single legislator that wants to hurt public education. Um, that's that. That's an accusation that is made that is completely false. Everyone wants it to be better, and it's just a question of how we get there. But honestly, to a certain extent, the local counties um, have, a, have a lot more power and responsibility, especially after that education reform bill of 2019. And I believe that the school board members, some of them don't know some of them just don't realize how much power they have. Um, and there's just a lot of, of opportunities that are being missed because they, they're just not willing to think outside of what, what the way things are done. And there's, a, you know, experts that come in and tell them, you should be doing this. And they do it without analyzing, well, is this actually going to make any kind of difference, or is this just taking more money out of the classroom? So there's an educational um, component there to the local school boards, and, and again, uh, there's a, a school board association, and I've been trying to work with them about the education that they are providing school board members. School board members in West Virginia is an elected position of four years, and there are folks who get on and they have a very good idea of, of how they can make things better. But a lot of them, they just have good intentions, but they don't really have um, clear ideas. And I think most of the population doesn't realize that they can talk to their school board members and they can advocate for things at their school board level. Um, 
So I'm sorry. I know I'm talking a lot. Senator Rucker, and that, that uh, we take it right up to 9 o'clock, so we are out of time. Thank you so much oh, for wow. yours this morning, and enjoy the warmer weather of Arizona.